Hey y'all, new day, new verse. As we continue on into chapter 21, today we are doing verses 12 through 17. Jesus clears the temple. Here we go. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priests and teachers of religious law saw that these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany, where he stayed overnight. Now, there are a couple things in this verse that almost made me want to do it as separate videos. Like the first bit of 12 on to 13. You know, he's quoting Jeremiah, he's quoting Isaiah, he's pointing out that what they're doing is the same thing their ancestors did. It's the, well, we say we know God because we're in charge of the religion, but we don't really know him because we're missing the spirit of it. We're missing the love. We're missing him. And then going on to the next of it, that, you know, after he clears out the temples and flips it, uh, you know, gets everybody out who's not supposed to be there. You know, because the temple offerings were supposed to be about bringing God your best. They weren't supposed to be about a fiscal amount. These ideas came later. Initially, it was literally just about bringing God your best, because it all comes from Him anyway. It got religion on along the way, to the point where everybody's like, well, I time on every tenth. Um, the Old Testament full number is 26.6% across the entire thing. So it's not about the money. Especially since Jesus himself points out the women who gave the two pence. She's just given more than anybody, else, or than anybody else. Because she's giving more than she has. She's giving beyond that. She's giving everything. And she's doing it in trust. And it, you know, it started thinking about instead this temple and what it looks like. Because he's healing the lame and the blind. And he's healing people who have all of these different problems. And the priests and the religious leaders... The insiders, as they see themselves, and as the world sees them, are missing it entirely. So much so that they get indignant about seeing people healed. About hearing children sing praises to God. And it's really beautiful to me that the same psalm, Psalm 8, that says that you have heard, you know, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. You know, it's the praises come from the babbling mouths of infants and small children that are made as a stronghold against the enemy. That God is very much interested in looking after what everyone considers less or other. I mean, children even nowadays are, well, you're a kid. Oh, you're a youth. You don't know. Well, seems here that they might know something we don't. You know, we have the expression in the Western world, out of the mouth of babes. That's straight out of the Bible. It's, and it comes from this understanding that, you know, before you spend your life learning how to play the world's game, there are certain things we understand. It strikes me that, because you know, these kids are calling it like they see it, like every small child does. You know, it's not this connected to the infinite thing that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, just for a moment, calling it like you see it. That's what these children are doing. You know, these little kids, they grew up on hearing the Torah told to them. So when they see it happening, and then they start shouting, look, it's happening, here's the son of David, they're rejoicing, because the same psalm, Psalm 8, is also the one that says, what are mere humans that you concern yourself that the God creator of everything loves human beings so much that he cares about the minutia. He cares about the number of hairs on our heads. He cares about everything about us. And so while he's sitting here you know, helping those who are less fortunate, healing those in need of miracles, the kids are running around and enjoying the life. This place of prayer where God is moving in the middle, meeting them, seeing to their needs and giving them peace. Like he does for us today when we let him. He respects our free will. If we want him to take the pain away, he does. And he will. If we want to hold on to the pain, 
he'll let us keep it. And that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees are doing here. They're getting indignant. They're holding on to their tradition. They're holding on to something rather than embracing the one who is there in their midst. They're holding on to what they have resigned themselves to being the form and function. They tried to put God in a box rather than just embracing the fact that he's there in that moment. Because the children are speaking the truth. They're calling it like they see it. If you're fat, you'll know it. Just ask a small kid. It's not because they're trying to be cruel. It's because they don't know any better. They're just being blunt about it. The same here is true of these little kids. They're seeing, praise God for the Son of David. They're seeing the Messiah. They're seeing freedom. Those stuck in their ways, are missing that freedom. And it's interesting that it's a type of freedom that goes past the surface to this freedom of not actually being bound to that way of thinking. So that you can have the childlike faith moments of, well, no, it's God. It's this sky blue, water wet, God good. It's just a simple statement of fact. It's witnessing to the fact of the thing. And I think it's beautiful that the verse he leaves off on, or the, rather the verses we're leaving on him referencing, is Psalms. A praise song. Let me see if I can find it here super quick, even. I'd been pouring it over earlier. And bookmarks are a useful thing. And sadly, I don't have a crude help of things. Here we go. <laughs> Always comes back to Psalm 21. In here. Yeah, here we go. Psalm 8. Because this is what he's referencing. When Jesus says that, haven't you heard read in scripture, you have taught children and infants to give you praise? This is the psalm he's referencing. And the entire psalm, which, mind you, is a psalm for a choir director to be accompanied by a string instrument. This is a song. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic! Your, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. Going from the Greek rather than the Hebrew. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than Elohim. No, spiritual entities. You then crowned him with glory and honor. You have given them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O Yahweh our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. It's a song. It's a song recognizing that God sees what the world calls lesser and embraces it with love. He sees who the world calls other and draws them near in love. And he does so because it is his nature, his character, who he is. As image bearers, it's what we are meant to be. But it failed to be. All have fallen short of the glorious and glory of God. But we don't have to flog ourselves. We can embrace that God will set it right. He already has. He stood in the gap. He died for our sins. He died in our place. So do you want to enjoy the playground or not? His small children then, small children now. They call it like they see it. They're blunt. And bluntly, they're shouting out what they see. The Messiah has come. He's a healer, a way maker, miracle worker, prince of peace, mighty God, the Holy One. And those who are willing to put down themselves, and I don't mean talk down about it, I mean lay down before the cross the parts of them, their whole being. They're not going to be able to be free. 
The Pharisees and the Sadducees, their hearts were more interested in their form and function of it, their way of doing it, than they were about the miracles happening right in front of them. They're seeing this. They're hearing this. Everything is shouting, look, 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 God is right here in your midst moving. But because they wanted to focus on their expectations, their religion, their structures, their expectations, all of these things. No, I said it twice, the reason. Because they were focused on that instead, they didn't see what God was doing in their midst. I think that with everything going on in this world, we're probably focusing on the wrong things. You know, the world's on fire, it's torture, damnation, God is in the midst. God is in the middle. God is giving a safety place, a sanctuary of peace. But I don't think it looks the way we expect it to. I think it looks different. I think it is a freedom that gives a place to be able to love even your enemies. And I sometimes sincerely wonder if when every single moment God is in the midst, if the only reason we're having the struggles is because we fail to turn around and look at Him. He knows the storm's there. He also gives strength to walk on water or to pass through the sea. Nothing surprises Him. Nothing shocks Him. He said, what is happening would happen. So why fear? Why play the world's game? If you're supposed to love your enemy as you love yourself, and we're supposed to love ourselves, well, the way God loves us, not because we love ourselves, but because he shows us what love is. It's other-centric, all of it. So why should we start behaving any other way now? Why should we stop believing that God is miracle worker and that he'll see us through? Because the temple is beautiful. The playground is wonderful. Do we want to focus on it? Or do we want to focus on God who made it go directly to the source of life? rather than just getting caught up in the beauty of it. Because this is all going deeper. All of it deeper, needing to pursue the Creator God. The source of all life. Yahweh. Who's not interested in money, not interested in money changers, or balances, or bookkeeping, or anything else like that, the way we in the world have made it. Rather, he is interested in us. Healing the lame and the lame, healing the blind. Welcoming children unto him. Peace on earth. Not given by this world, and so it cannot be taken by this world. But given from him who was and is and is to come. If you want that kind of peace, chase after him. If you don't, keep doing anything else, and you won't. The choices are that simple, that black and white. We may operate in the gray, and God sees that. He sees our struggle. But the choice, the choice is black and white. Do you want God or not? The answer is no. Look at the world. You'll see what you get. Biting, clawing, ravenous, ravaging, bestial behavior. Or you can live in peace. Drawing life from the source of life. Because Jesus is the way. The choice is yours. He is love. All love comes from Him. Let Him teach you how to truly agape. So that when you love, 
It is a real love, not a false or childish one, but a love that goes deeper, a love that says, I will love my enemies because Christ already died for me. I know it's solemn and I know it's somber and I'm not trying to bring anyone down. I'm just being honest here. With everything going on, the choice is simple. God or not. It's not a fun one. It's not an easy one. Now if you truly dig into it, lay down your entire being. Because as I've said before, it will cost you everything and nothing. The children, it costs them nothing. They said the truth. They knew the truth as they saw it. For the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were indignant, it would cost them everything. What should you rather be? His? The Lord's? Or not? Because the clock's ticking down either way. He's coming. So do you want love? Or the indignance that comes by focusing on the world rather than being in the presence of the one who made it in the first place? I will see you guys then as we continue on with the interesting parts of Matthew 21 tomorrow with verses 18 through 22. Depending on how it plays out, we shall see. I am hoping to post it and get on to the interesting of Jesus cursing the fig tree. Because it's always been one that's had me question and ponder. And it'll be fun to share it with you too. I'll see you then. May his favor be upon you and know that you are loved. He wants to draw you out of the fire. All you got to do is let him. So let's let him. I'll see you then.